Welcome to the Americas Identity, Culture, and Power. No issue has been more controversial in American society in the last few years than immigration. And no one is better qualified to speak about immigration than Nestor Rodriguez. He is a professor in the sociology department at the University of Houston, and he's also director of the university's Center for Immigration Research. We often hear about globalization, but no phenomena makes globalization more concrete or human than immigration. Boundaries that separated people historically have collapsed right before our eyes. And all of us, I think, need to understand why this is happening and what it foretells for our society and our culture and for the people involved. So let's begin our class today by asking one of the country's premier experts on immigration what is happening and where it is leading. So let me start out with a question for you, if I might. And, and that is, in the 1980s, more immigrants entered the United States than in any other decade in American history. Why is this happening? Well, we see there are obviously um, several reasons. One reason is just the continuation of history. People have always immigrated here. And in fact, while in the 1980s more people came to the U.S. than any other decade, it really wasn't by a great, great deal more. Okay? And I'm thinking of the decades of the 1910 to the 1920s when we really reached, in terms of legal immigration, a peak. And today we look at immigration as the largest number in any decade, throwing in the undocumented. So it's, and I think you know, people continue to come for some of the same reasons, the, the, uh, the opportunity for betterment, uh, the dream that they have of coming to this country. But we look at where are the people coming from, and I understand why they come. You know, people come because they're looking for opportunities or because they're trying to escape political persecution, or, or even gender persecution for that matter, or sexual persecution. And we see that you know, the greatest numbers come from Latin America and, and, and Asia. And we look at those economies, what's, what has been happening in those economies, in those societies? Well, where do they come from from Latin America? Mexico and Central America are big areas of origin for immigrants. What's going on in Mexico? Well, 1982, as we know, they had this great devaluation, uh, economic problems. Uh, anytime you have an area with, that's economically stressed, you're going to have population movements. In Mexico, we see great population movements towards the cities, Mexico City, Monterrey, etc., but also movements abroad. Okay? People come because they're developing household strategies sometimes to supplement their income back home by having family members migrate and send money back. Other people come because they're, they're in fact developing binational families, uh, meaning that some of the family members are going to be in the U.S. and they're going to be sending back money or the family is divided into countries. So we're looking at strategies for family survival as a reason. We're looking at what we call economic restructuring as another reason, uh, changes in the economy, uh, economic cycles fluctuation. And then we look at Central America. Central America has all of that, but it also has a lot of political unrest in the 1980s when many people came. Look at min most of the people came from El Salvador in Central America. El Salvador. Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala, which were like areas of a lot of social turmoil. All of Latin America, and, the, and certainly in, in the early 1980s, was going through this, what we call the, the big crisis, la crisis, and, and Mexico and Central America were caught in this. Those were times of fluctuation in the global economy, and uh, the prices of oil. Some of these countries had, uh, in Central America had a lot of problems meeting foreign debt, and paying more for their oil, et cetera, et cetera. So the roots aren't simply individual choice. The roots seem to be really deeper, yeah. much more structural. Yeah, in fact, there, there are different roots, with levels of roots, you know. One, you can have, you always have to do with the psychology of what is a personality that's more likely to, to venture out or the adventure zone, right? But then you have to look at the family level as well. What are the family needs and resources for survival and stability? Then you look at what we call structural institutional levels of what's happening 
across institutions, political, economic, financial, employment. So all of this, plus what's happening here that's attracting workers. It's a very, very complicated issue of why people migrate and why so many came in the 1980s. But we do know this, that the 1980s were periods of high economic, and in many areas, political stress in Latin America, and many migrants came. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, it, at this end of migration, I'm quite struck by the fact that immigrants seem to move into certain areas and not into others, mm -hmm. uh, into big cities as opposed to rural areas, and particularly into certain states. Mm -hmm. uh, the figures that I've seen is that something like three-quarters of all immigrants have migrated to California mm -hmm. or Texas or New York or okay. New Jersey. Okay. Why there? Well, first, why do they migrate to the cities and not to rural areas? Uh -huh. Okay, because a, a larger labor force now works in urban areas than in rural areas. Though it's very important to understand that among rural, rural labor forces, the migrants constitute a very high proportion of that as well. Okay, But you're right, the largest number of migrants, international migrants, immigrants, go to those areas you've mentioned. What, what is it about those areas? Well, there are several things. One, those are areas of, of usually of high growth, of historical immigration. Okay, so there's a people tend to migrate, not always, but often where other people have migrated before, often own family members. Okay, so those are areas that are experiencing growth, but they also have a history of immigrant communities. That's where people arrive, because okay? so they find sponsorship with other immigrants. Okay, but what we're also seeing is that. There are other new areas, especially not captured by the 1990 census. Like I see a lot of la Mexican migration into Georgia, northern Georgia, and the Carolinas. Interesting. New industries. This is Mexican migration. The next census, the year 2000, will show Mexican communities, populations, in Georgia, and the Carolinas, in Arkansas. Uh, so that migrants are also, they're attracted by opportunities, and employers are attracted to them and create those opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. um, in the, much of the much of the backlash against migration attempts to to s control it, uh, especially in California, it seemed we reached sort of a feverish pitch and yeah. uh, had taken on political partisan tones. But the question uh, th that always uh, occurred to me was: it seems like, um, and especially after what you suggested, perhaps you can comment. To what extent is this influx of migration, this labor force, actually very critical to the development of economic uh, well-being mm -hmm. within the country? Because it's, on the one hand, it seems like there's a, there's the, oh, we don't want the immigrants to come to take away jobs. But right. on the other hand, it, this might seem to be very critical for yeah. economic growth in this country. It's a, it's a, again, it's a, very, um, it's a very complex issue, the labor market impact of immigration. Mm -hmm. And we're looking mainly at the lower end. Okay? Mm -hmm. We're not going to discuss the winning migrants who are nuclear scientists or great <coughs> basketball players because we know that <laughs> those are not up for debate. We usually want them and we think. But the debate and the controversy occurs at the lower end of the labor market. We have, I just, I'll just let you know what I found in my own research. I have found cases that show that employers, I've, I've interviewed many employers, prefer immigrant workers, they say, because they work harder, they complain less, uh, and in fact, they also constitute a sort of a, a mechanism of self-recruitment. Mm -hmm. That is, if you're an employer and you need to expand your, your labor force within a week, you know, because you have greater uh, things to do, you may have to construct or you may have to manufacture something, the immigrants themselves will, will help you find more workers. So it's like a self-sustaining, self-reproducing labor market, and employers find a lot of advantages there, not to mention that you know, immigrants in general tend to not not organize into unions mm -hmm. uh, compared to U.S. workers. So the the immigrant labor creates a lot of advantages. That in fact, when you translate that into what do we get out of it, the common person on the street, right, is that because of their low wages and, and maybe they they do without health care, etc., they're in a way partly subsidizing things that we consume. You go into restaurants and you see the undocumented or you don't see them, you see immigrants uh, and they're working for a min very minimum wage or even sub-minimum wage, then part of that saving is best on to us. I pay 80 cents or 75 for a cup of coffee, right, because some guy or some woman is, is only making minimum wage. So in a way, we also benefit. The critical question, though, for, for the race by labor economists is 
this is fine and well, but to what extent is that then causing unemployment among you as workers? Okay. And again, I, I have found evidence that, to look at, at both sides of that. There are some places where they only hire immigrant workers uh, because they find them that they're better workers uh, in terms of they work harder and longer and complain less, okay? To the extent, I kind of call these places as constituting reserve labor markets, reserved for immigrants. They're very identifiable and U.S. workers know where these places are and they even stop looking for work in those places, okay? Uh, so there I can see some some maybe some competition for jobs but on the other hand we know that immigrants are not just producers they're also consumers so that they create a market by their presence here in many many ways they consume gasoline and their vehicles clothing all kinds of services and products so or just going to restaurants and buy things and eat things so that they are a demand right they create a demand that then helps to invigorate the economy uh, and create m employment in that way. Okay, mm -hmm. so in one way we can see maybe some competition and maybe displacement of U.S. workers, but I think it's that's really a, I should say, um, not as large an impact as as some people would like you to believe. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we know for sure that they're eating, they're sleeping, they're traveling, and they're they're dressing, so they're also consuming. Okay, so there's a trade-off. I think overall we see that pr pr the benefits outweigh the disadvantages of this labor force, especially for the middle class, because I think in service industries where many immigrants work, they, they really subsidize, I think. We're not paying a dollar fifty for for coffee, or at least where I go to drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Americans have always had a deep ambivalence about immigration. We think mm -hmm. of ourselves as a nation of immigrants where we attract the tempest-tossed <laughs> poor, and yet at the same time we've also had recurrent waves of nativism, of hostility towards immigrants, right. and we're living through one of those waves right now. Why do Americans vacillate on this issue? Well, I think if you look at, and we've graphed this, the waves of immigration, you know, we're like in the fourth wave since 1825, and I select 1825 because when we started keeping, systematically keeping immigration statistic. And usually it's not surprising that whenever you're, you're reaching a peak of a wave as we are now, we have now, there's, there's a reaction to this. There are too many immigrants, and we feel like uh, maybe they overwhelm the cap institutional capacity of the U.S. to incorporate them. But uh, it's, it's almost hard, and I and I, we have to resist this to generalize nativism for all the ways. We know that it's easy to generalize that there are reactions, that are critical or restrictionist movements against immigration, but sometimes they surface for, for different reasons, okay? For example, when we look at the immigration of the Irish in the 1800s and even the early part of this century, there was nativism against us because they were Catholic. Okay? And there was a lot of movements to, to oust the Irish, to burn down their church. In fact, there were places Irish were attacked in Philadelphia and Boston Catholic churches were burned down, communities were attacked. So what is it about a specific, then we, then we see in that we say, what is it about a specific group that draws this attack? Not that, that it's, it's responsible for it, but that people tend to dislike. Well, what is it about the present immigration wave? We know that now only about, what, 10% of immigrants are coming from Europe, and so that means that 90% of immigrants are coming from Latin America, Asia, Africa, the Caribbean. And this is a very different immigrant, and there are a lot of, they contrast with our concept of the immigrant. Uh, the concept of the immigrant, when we think of the Statue of Liberty, is not some Laotian refugee or some Guatemalan Maya coming from the highlands, but it's maybe the German family, the Italian with their suitcases at Ellis Island, you know. And so that we're kind of working with old concepts, but we're seeing a different immigrant. I, I, but, but I think we also have to recognize, though, that not all of this is just a spontaneous popular reaction. That, in fact, there are organizations out there uh, that, that, that exist. They're funded deliberately because they are, are restrictionists, and it's their job to promote restrictionist policies for whatever reasons. And they vary from uh, immigrants overload our labor market to uh, immigrants are genetically inferior, and we don't want those people here. And so there are organizations that are very politically active across the country and in Washington 
to to promote an anti-immigrant uh, restrictionist sense. So they deserve some of the credit too. Do they fall along party lines or ideological lines? Well, if you look at the, the you know, in, uh, we just passed one of the most uh, restrictive immigration bills, you know, certainly this right. century. And it got great support from Democrats and Republicans. The ones who seem to be like, I guess, the only place you've, you have found in the last few years uh, support for more immigration, in fact, open borders, are well, the f kind of like t two very <laughs> opposite places. One is obviously the, let's say, uh, activists, internationalists who think that borders divide communities and that shouldn't happen, or the working class, whatever. But then you have like big capital. The Wall Street Journal always has been for open borders, and they run editorials on that, okay? So that there are ideological positions there, and that is, you know, uh, we need the free flow of labor to create greater competition in the labor market. You know, if you, if you fall back on capitalistic pr principles of supply and demand and free competition, then obviously, uh, and if you think of capitalism as a, as a global system, not a system of any nation state, then it, it makes no sense to have borders because you're dividing. You know? And so the, the Wall Street Journal makes that argument. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, people at, in the middle are like, I think sometimes responding to fear or images or concerns that they have. And we see that fluctuating. Uh, I think last year, most of the national polls show that most, most Americans wanted more restrictions on immigration. In 1993, uh, let's say, a majority of, of, of Americans said, we don't need more restrictions. In 1993, we don't need fences at the border. And you know, three years later, they said yes. Now that seems to be, you know, that, that seems to be uh, lessening. I think the Chronicle had a, an article over the weekend of a recent survey in the Houston area, and most people, only a minority thought we had to reduce immigration by, you know, to reduce it even further. Interesting. You see how I can, I can talk about this all day? You, you, ask, a, <laughs> you ask a question and I respond for five minutes. No, but this is great. Yeah. What would be your own take on this issue of the, uh, of a border that should be, whether the border should be s more impermeable or less impermeable? And uh, would it be, uh, should it be more impermeable for certain kinds of things or less impermeable you know, for other kinds, sorts of? Yeah, it, well, it, it seems to me, and, and here I take very much a historical perspective, I think, is that if you look at the history of, how shall I say, economic development, mm -hmm. globalization, especially of the capitalist world system, how it's expanded and all the resources it's able to energize and circulate and gravitate, that what's What's clear is that more and more actually, economic development and even movement and migration of human populations and communities uh, are greater so that less and less we see the nation state functioning as an economic unit of organization. Okay? If you go back to the nation state, we see that you know, it's something that evolved in the, in the early Middle Ages through the, and through the mid Middle Ages. And at that time, it seemed to, to work as a, as a unit of economic organization, going to mercantilism and things like that. Today, industries and corporations are very international in nature, and they play with international resources. Mm -hmm. okay? So that for them, okay, nation-state boundaries are less and less important, and in fact, more and more barriers. The Japanese come into Mexico, and they want to set up factories. And you know we go into Spain or we go into here or there, and we want to do the same. So it seems that if you look at the historical trend here, and it's a secular one, that the function of nation-state borders seems to be diminishing, certainly for economic uh, development. It, I don't think there was ever much of a cultural border between the U.S. and Mexico in that area. Because, and, and I, I've often said this, it was really a U.S. border, not a Mexican one. Because yes. the Mexicans always migrate. <laughs> they, they, they. I mean, I, my own grandfather used to tell me before they even had border patrol, my grandfather used to just walk across the border and he'd pay five cents at the border and that's all you had to do. You know. <laughs> and socially, I don't think that the border is, is as relevant as it used to be before. You know, I mean, to say people travel back and forth and they interact. It's certainly at the political dimension that then we say, okay, well, we, sh we need to make sure that people who vote in our elections, let's say the presidential election, are people who actually who reside here north of the U.S.-Mexican border and south of the Canadian-U.S. border. Mm 
So that I think that, you know, the border is a, it's a great divider for, for cultural or social or economic reasons, that that is greatly diminished now. Uh, we're very becoming a transnational community. We live in global context. But certainly for the, for the political di di dimension, I think we're, you know, we're, we're hanging on to the border, and it's very important at that point. But even that, too, shall pass. <laughs> I think we may have federations or something like that. If you look at Europe, they're doing away with their borders for many things. And anybody can vote in anybody else's school elections. Okay? Everybody still has to vote for their own president. But if you travel and you live, if you're a German and live in France, you can vote at school, school district elections and things like that, or municipal elections. So that's all going to be changing. Well, let, let me then follow that up. If one were to eliminate all border <laughs> regulations, wouldn't that lead to unlimited immigration? Well, that's true. So you know, I can only refer to the, to the European uh, example because they are working with this. And it, it seems that it would eliminate and, well, if you eliminate the border, you're going to have, the, I guess the image we have in our mind is like all Mexicans are coming to the U.S. Well, first, and before I deal with that, let's say, research done in Mexico shows that in many communities, uh, certainly fewer than 10% uh, of the people migrate or express a desire to migrate. Interesting. If you look at the population, look at the percentage of all who are here and all the total population of Mexico, it's certainly less than 10 percent, maybe 4 percent or something like that. So the idea that every Mexican wants to come here is not really that <laughs> smart. When you go into Mexico and you talk, you, you talk about immigration, this is what I found. I was in Mexico in January. And I know immigration was a big issue. In Mexico, it was not an issue, okay? Nobody talked about it. There was no intellectual debate outside government circles because they need to, government circles need to interact with the U.S. on those bases. And not only was it not an issue, but people in Mexico are critical of migrants to the U.S. They sense them like, you know, these are people who have no pride. They're leaving Mexico, for God's sake. Like, why would you want to go to the U.S. when you can live in Mexico? Uh, they've betrayed us. So that really to be a migrant in Mexico is to be considered deviant. Okay. So I'm saying those things only to dispel the myth that every Mexican is waiting just to get in here. Because it's, it's, the, it's, it's really a small minority who migrate. Okay. And in fact, within Mexico, they're often branded as deviants. And it's only been lately that the Catholic Church has this, a deliberate program to welcome back the migrants, uh, of course, because they need their, their remittance, their contributions, <laughs> right? <laughs> let's, let's re there's this program of let's reaccept the migrants as part of our communities, because for so long they're branded as deviants. So I don't think that, uh, I don't think that we'd see this 97 or 90 million Mexicans coming over. The other point is, Opening up the border doesn't mean that it opens the border just for Mexico. It opens the border also for us, right? And so that I'd, I'd like to go and not only travel, but maybe buy a piece of real estate in Mexico and then take our companies there. Mm -hmm. So we began to then, what is it that we're doing? Well, we're building one country out of two. And I know this sounds probably highly radical at 1 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday. <laughs> I've never seen this. <laughs> <laughs> but we're able to fictionalize and project fiction into the future, I guess. So then the whole idea is then that you're, you're going to have greater exchanges of capital, people migrating, companies down there, and workers going on there. So if you can then create sort of a balance in wage differentials, then there's no, if, if wages are why people come, then there would be less of a reason for them to migrate. But, you know, I think the problem with immigration research is that too often it's been done by economists or by social scientists who focus only on the economic dimension. Because I know that people come for a lot many other reasons than just employment. You know. sure. There's family, there's culture, and it's, you know, it's, we need to study that more. Let me ask you a tough mm. and really controversial yeah. question. Uh, throughout American history, many African American leaders have been convinced mm -hmm. that migration works systematically against the interests of black Americans. Right. So, Frederick Douglass in the 19th century, Booker T. Washington at the beginning of the 20th mm -hmm. century, and then Barbara Jordan in our own time have argued that by restricting immigration, those people at the very bottom mm -hmm. of our right. social structure will have greater opportunities. What would you say to these people? Those are very, very important questions. And in fact, they're important that last year, 
Professor Tasha Mendiola and I and uh, a professor in uh, Yolanda Flores Neiman in psychology did a random scientific survey in Harris County of Hispanics and African Americans. And we posed those questions to the African American community. We asked them things like, uh, what is the impact of immigration for the Houston area overall? And to be honest, a majority, but a small majority, something like 52% of the African Americans said the impact's bad. But like 40% said the impact is good. Okay, and I found that surprising. That's interesting. I thought that was surprising. We asked the question of uh, things like, do, Af do immigrants take away jobs from African Americans? And again, we had a similar response. Okay, uh, 52, 53% said yes, and that no. We went further and we asked questions like, is it okay f for immigrants to use Spanish in the workplace? And there we began to see something different. That is, 45% said, yes, it's okay to use Spanish in the workplace, and 45% said, no, it's not okay. We asked s several immigration-related questions to the African-American sample, and they were very, they were all, as many said, favored immigration as this favored it. So we found that there's not one social mind among African-Americans on immigration, that they're very divided about this issue uh, more than Anglos are, more than Hispanics are if they're divided at all, okay? And what this represents to me is that it's possible, I think, that African Americans are reacting to the immigration question a lot more intelligently than other groups are who've already made up their minds either one side or the other. Because among African Americans, it's a debate. Again, not everybody speaks to it with an open mind. That doesn't answer directly your question, but I'll get to it now. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, and, and the, are immigrants taking jobs away from African Americans? In some places, in some cases, I think they are because I've interviewed in workplaces where, where African Americans used to be hired and now they only hired immigrants. Okay, this is not like across the labor market, but I found a few here and there. And so I, I have to say yes to some extent, and I say to some extent because I don't think if you took away every immigrant worker and sent them back to where they came from, Mexico, Central America, or Europe, or Asia, whatever that that would mean that unemployed blacks would have full employment. Mm -hmm. I wish it would. You know, they'd say, it's all worthwhile. Let's close down the border. But I think that there are issues of racism, mm -hmm. racial discrimination, racial oppression, that even with the absence of all immigrants, you're still going to have unemployment, and you're going to have a lot of unemployment among the African-American communities and, and the, and the U.S.-born Latino community. Because these are communities that whose problems do, do not flow solely out of labor market competition with immigrants, but who f whose problems flow out of a subordinate position they've held in U.S. society for many years and continue to hold because of institutional racism or discrimination. Okay, So I, the answer being is uh, there is, even if you take away all the immigrants, you're still going to have high unemployment among some populations. Very interesting. It's a very complicated issue. Yes. Uh, there is a view, I think, that's fairly widespread that in the early 20th century when immigrants migrated to the United States, they migrated for jobs or mm -hmm. to better their living standard or to escape political or religious oppression, yeah. but that now because we have a welfare state, people migrate because they can get access to social yeah. benefits. <clears throat> what, has, what have you found about that issue? Well, first, uh, yeah, a lot of people believe that. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, the U.S. government, based on that fear or, or image, has now passed a very uh, intolerant welfare bill that effectively throws out many immigrants, from, especially the elderly, from SSI and what have we. But let's go to the, to the research findings. Let's go to statistics. Professor Frank Beam at the Population Research Center, you went to Texas at Austin, looked at uh, poverty among the U.S.-born population and among foreign-born. And he finds that the foreign-born indeed have greater rates of poverty, uh, but not, not, not by a great amount, but they are, there's greater rates of poverty. But what it finds is that foreign-born poor people are less likely to go on welfare than foreign-born uh, U.S.-born people, okay? So that immigrants suffer poverty at greater amounts, but they're less likely to go on welfare. What is it, what's the bottom line here? What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about something like almost 20%, or let's say 20% of immigrant households 
or, or receiving public assistance, one out of five, okay? Which is a lot different than all immigrants are coming here to go on welfare, not even half, not even a third, okay? Not even a fourth, we're talking about a fifth. But still a fifth, it's a fifth, and I think that that creates an image that other people then magnify and exaggerate to a much greater number. I've gone beyond that. I've asked, I've been doing research, you know, for many years now in the Houston area, and I've asked the immigrants, so what do you think about welfare? And I find that in some communities, the more traditional ones, there's almost like a self-sanctioning of it. I've, I've talked to a friend of mine who's from Guatemala, and he said, well, he said, I hate to admit it, but there are some members of my community from my hometown who live in Houston who've gone on welfare. He said, and that's not right. You know, this country let us in. We should work hard. And he said, sometimes I feel like reporting them to someone. <laughs> so, okay. So the idea that all immigrants are like in the starting blocks at the border to get into the welfare lines is really not true. What's actually happening for most immigrants is that they're in the starting blocks to get ready for the employment line. And we see them on street corners. You know. There's some fear today that the immigrant group that are coming are relative to the rest of the population in the United States right now less educated and less skilled. Uh, part of that is just simply that in this country people sure. become more educated and more skilled. And there's a fear that that gap will persist once people come to the United States and we will create even more than we already have a two-tiered society. Does right. your research suggest anything about that well, concern? There, there, I think there's, there's three points that come out in, in our research. You know, one point is that you know, the, the level of education and income producing ability varies by group. Because while Latino immigrants from Mexico, let's say in Central America, tend to come from the lower end of ed educational attainment and income producing skills, uh, let's say other groups, Asian groups, tend to come from a middle, you know, from a higher up. So you, you really can't generalize. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, yes, there are large numbers of immigrants coming who don't have, let's say, college or even high school. But that's been the history of, of this country. And that is that they come, they start at the lower echelons or the lower levels of the labor market. Over 10, e over 10 years, they gain some human capital and have some, some job mobility. Okay, but we're always, you know, the dream of immigration is not really the first generation, it's the second generation. Well, what does your research show on that? Because I've read in the newspaper mm -hmm. some accounts which argue that the second generation is not doing as well as previous second generations. Mm. That's true, too. And, well, oh, let's say overall, but okay. again, you have to examine, because it's certainly not true for, let's say, the Asians, and it's not true for its middle class immigrants. We're talking, those, those findings really relate to more to lower income immigrants, to working class immigrants. Uh, and there are reasons for that. One is many of them come unprepared. They, they overwhelm our school systems. We're putting more money in prisons now, I think, in some places in schools. And we really can't handle a student who comes, let's say, if they're 12 years old or 10 years old, don't know English. You know, they're not going to do that. Well, many of them will drop out and help families. So that, that, is a, I mean, that, that, that is a problem, that, that is something that's not helping us and that we have to figure out ways to deal with it, whether it be like GED or job training or what have we. Uh, we also have, I think, a situation where we have high concentrations of immigrants in areas where their people are less likely to, to want to spend taxes on services. They have tax revolts in California. You know, tax association you want to cut back. So <laughs> you have opposite tendencies here, and it, it's, it, it's certainly not good. The classic American vision of immigration was the melting pot. And even when Americans spoke about pluralism, they really meant the melting pot. That mm -hmm. is that people would absorb yeah. a common set of cultural attitudes and traditions. Sure. Uh, how would you evaluate that? I mean, is, is that still the dominant ideal? Is it a desirable ideal? Uh, well, it's for, I think we'll say it was it ever a real ideal, a reality. And I think, again, when we look at the melting pot, it's really not the first generation that, if you want to use the word melts, okay. 
sometimes I agree with it, there's a meltdown <laughs> in some areas. It's, it's the second generation, it's the other generation. And we see, I think, that what we're seeing today, and we've had the statistics to show this, it's not really that different than what we saw even last century. Okay? And that it was, for all the talk about melting pot, the first generation of Germans, the first generation of Irish, of Italians, whatever, always maintain their, their uniqueness or ethnic distinction. I mean, there was a time when you go back to Franklin and, and Jefferson, they worried. They were sort of the anti-immigrant uh, leaders. And they always worried that German was, was going to be the, 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 the language of the country. And there was this, this linguistic conflict. Mm -hmm. I think now we, I'm bringing that up because we think of Spanish and the mm -hmm. lack of the melting pot. But having just again finished a survey on immigration and, uh, and among immigrants, I found that this wha whereas something like 75% of all immigrants, Hispanic immigrants in Houston favored Spanish, they use the Spanish, we found that among the U.S. born Hispanics, including the second generation, something like 87% favored English. So that linguistically, there certainly is a melting so it's not really a melting because a melting means that whatever comes is produced incorporates elements from all the other cultures. And linguistically, we see that English is still very dominant. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, groups are coming together linguistically. And I think certainly the second generation, the youth, I mean, you can just see them. They, they're, they're more American, I think kids from Guatemala, and they're more American now than their parents. They don't identify, they identify more with Jewish culture was there, than with the country of origin culture. That's interesting. Uh, you could go to any <laughs> bar room in Houston, I suspect, and find a discussion about mm -hmm. why some immigrant groups get ahead and why don't other immigrant groups get ahead economically. Right. And some people would argue that it has to do with racism and discrimination, and other people would talk about culture. Mm -hmm. Um, so what's the answer? Well, I, my, as a sociologist, <laughs> I cannot help but say social class is the answer. Okay. But if I, if I had to predict for money, maybe the mm -hmm. Texas lotto or something, <laughs> <laughs> which group, which immigrant group is going to get ahead and which is not, I would say, well, which immigrant has the greatest middle class? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you look at the Cuban American experience, immigration, though that experience also had a lot of support from the U.S. government, more than, mm -hmm. than is commonly known because it had to be made a model of success right. to compare for what was supposed to be a model, and perhaps there's a model of failure in Cuba, okay? But if you look at the Asian experience of immigration, those who came as middle class people was human capital, I almost hate that term, but they use it a lot, yeah. meaning skills mm -hmm. and education, et cetera, et cetera, are the ones who, do, who get ahead. Invariably, groups that come heavily as working class or lower working class, campesino, peasants, they tend not to get ahead as fast, or it, it takes them generations, and some never do because they stay within the, the working class. Though still performing very important functions for this society, lest we forget, we right. still need a working class. We still need a, a lower working class who, 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 who work in restaurants, who wash our cars, and stuff like that. And we, we tend to think that every worker now should be a computer programmer. Maybe someday we'll get there when we're up there in the Space Federation somewhere. <laughs> but we still need people to do dirty work, okay? So they have a, an important function, too. Mm. But getting back to my response would be to predict which group gets ahead, what are the issues at play. I would say a most important one would be the social class background. That's of course there are issues of race, gender, okay, nationality. But how well you prepare, come prepared to participate in the marketplace is a great determinant uh, if you get ahead of that. That's very interesting. Immigration from Mexico is fundamentally different than immigration from any other country except perhaps Canada <laughs> in that there's geographic proximity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is much easier than in any other soci culture or society for people to cross the border sure. and to show that the border is a sort of abstraction at some level. Mm -hmm. uh, does this mean that immigration from Mexico will be fundamentally different than previous forms of immigration in this country? That is that a distinctive and authentic Mexican culture will remain in a way that German culture or Finnish culture or Swedish <coughs> culture did not. 
Yes, and I almost said, has, I'm, I'm, I'm almost uh, wanting to say no, and yes, because I think what's here will remain and will even be more of. For example, there's so much travel now between the U. Let's say Houston and uh, let's say Monterrey. Those are two sister cities, right? When I came here in '84, all the travel used to be by private car, maybe a few vans. By '88, there were a lot of vans, you know, taking people back and forth. Today, we have bus lines, huge European-built buses that are brought into Mexico and then used to run the, the routes between Monterrey, Houston, and many other towns in, in, in Mexico so that we're going to see more of this, of this culture, the Mexican culture, because there's more travel, much more communication. I mean, I turn on my radio at night, and there are Mexican radio stations in Monterrey or San Luis Potosí or Mexico City beaming broadcast programs to the U.S., for the Mexican nationals who are here, the migrants, right? I hear people in Monterrey dedicating a song to someone in a special neighborhood in Houston. And then somebody in Houston dedicating a song to someone in a neighborhood in Monterrey. So what I'm trying to say is <laughs> those two cultures, are, they're solid, and there'll always be this Mexican influence here, as long as there's a Mexico. And sometimes I don't know <laughs> everything that's happening in Mexico now. But what about the other cultures? Let's say the, the German or the... Italian or African, Caribbean or Asian. And I think that to the extent that the new technology of rapid uh, travel and instant communication, to the extent that they become new sources <coughs> conveying culture and uh, whatever it is that we mean by culture and all the elements of it, you know, that, that there may be, you may find communities that are able to reproduce uh, scenarios of their home countries here and still live, uh, remember what it is to be Vietnamese or to be this or that. Though I heard an interesting point the other day raised by someone that, that, the, that the ethnic enclaves, immigrant enclaves that we have here are really what their home countries used to be many years ago. Because the Vietnamese, for example, have changed and their culture will change. And the people who are here, for example, who, are, who live in Vietnamese communities may be practicing a culture of 20 years ago and may not, may not change like the one back home, or certainly not in the same direction. So it could be a bit like the Appalachians who speak uh, Elizabethan English, even S after England. Exactly. So that there will be linguistic changes back home in the home country, right? Uh, may, maybe even wa work in ironic ways. That is to say that maybe the Mexican immigrants here stay very Spanish dominant, and back in Mexico, a lot of people speak in English now. So. <laughs> That's maybe not a good example, but, but you can see that linguistic change may happen in the home country and not in the ethnic enclave here. And culturally, the people here are, like you said, the people in Appalachia who speak a certain English that's no longer found in the home country. In 1491, most people who, who people would call Negro mm -hmm. lived in Africa, and most people who were uh, Caucasian lived in Europe or Asia, mm -hmm. and uh, et cetera. And clearly, since 1492, you've had a radical movement of reshuffling of people across sure. the entire world. Do you think that this has changed people's ideas? I mean, do Americans today think of themselves as part of a multiracial, multi-ethnic society, or do they still uh, cling to older notions of a distinctive European culture? I think that there's nostalgia for the distinctive European culture that we're still very aware that for this country that was the source of, of our cultural framework, our society, government in some ways, okay? But I think that many people are aware, some less or more tolerant than others, that we're definitely becoming, especially our large metropolitan areas, very multi, uh, if not multiracial, certainly multi-ethnic and multi you know, multicultural. Well, let me follow up a bit mm -hmm. on that. Um, the statistics that I've seen suggest that for every immigrant that moves into a major metropolitan city, mm -hmm. one white moves out. And that's not cause and effect, but it's just a simple yeah. statement of demographic sure. facts. And what that would suggest to me is that this country, in a really fundamental way, is becoming two societies. That is, you have a cosmopolitan, diverse mm -hmm. set of urban areas combined with increasingly homogeneous right. uh, 
rural or suburban areas. Mm -hmm. And first of all, would that be accurate? And second of all, what does that mean for a society that has these sharp uh, disjunctions in experience? Yeah. Well, I think you're right that we do see greater concentration of immigrants, let's say, in central cities. Uh, white populations, or what we call Anglo populations here, often tend to move out into the suburbs. I mean, that's been a pattern of urban reorganization since the 60s. Um, and so what we're seeing, like in Houston now, everyone is uh, in city of Houston. Everyone is a minority, and it's the it's the minorities coming together. Uh, the traditional, the racial minorities, Latinos and African Americans, and I guess Asians, who now form the new racial minority majority. Okay, it's very complicated. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I th it may mean certain definite things for inner cities. That yeah, there's two societies, uh, you know, the ethnics and then the whites. Okay, and so that may mean maybe our mayor is going to be more ethnic. But you know, so that's that's a cleavage that hopefully we can avoid. And again, but let's let's remember that not all whites are leaving the city. Mm -hmm. In fact, I see a lot of in Houston, for example, a lot of community growth of certainly Anglo residents in certain areas where the city is being redeveloped. It's attractive. Look at the Heights where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's when I came here, people were leaving the Heights. Immigrants were moving in because there was a kind of surplus housing. And now I see immigrants. Fewer and fewer because there are more middle class, especially Anglo residents, moving in. Okay, but I do think that there is a danger there of creating this dual society. I don't. To me, the danger is not, and maybe I may be wrong. It's, it's not a cosmopolitan population versus a more homogeneous one. It's more a class population. That the cleavage will be, you know, that instead of getting this uh, more uh, equality, socioeconomic equality, we begin to see this. Hourglass-shaped stratification with a lot of affluence on top, a lot of poverty in the bottom. And that's the one that scares me. I think, you know, that if we have more middle class, that cultural diversity is not a problem because the middle class tends to be able to incorporate that and accommodate it uh -huh. in maybe even creative ways, because we know we're, this is all our project. We're in society together, but when you have severe economic you know, social class cleavages and stratification, that becomes, I think that's when we have greater problems. The question you raised, of course, I think it's really a question that sociologists, historians, and everyone will be answering for the next two centuries, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so I'll wait to hear the, the results in some other world. <laughs> well, I've asked my questions. Uh, Tetzil or our audience. It's I wanted to ask you, um, following the question about uh, yeah. space, you see the um, you see the the city being spatially segregated, or in terms of the groups, community segregation, according primarily in terms of class versus ethnicities. Well, we see both. I mean, and it's so big, it, and they overlap. It was ethnic segregation. We have still, you know, there's this there's this, the eastern half of the city uh, still very Latino and to some extent African American, right? The large, large majority of Anglos or whites live on the western half of the city. So that, that's, that's certainly there. So we see, <clears throat> and we're going to see more of that because many immigrants still settle in the eastern half of the city. So it, it's, we call it segregation, but it's, it's really like ethnic concentration. It is, if we look at segregation, the way it's used politically, it's when there are certain practices, either because of, of law or by tradition, that people belong to certain areas. That type of segregation seems to certainly have died out or is, is in the verse of, of, of dying out. Um, you're you're going to fall down if you yes. move. <laughs> um, in fact, I think in many ur large urban s uh, areas, urban areas, we see that the, the index of segregation for Hispanics has increased. So we say, what's happening? Are, are Hispanics being segregated again? Well, no, it just means that the more immigrants came in, so segregation increased because segregation is measured by concentration in census tracts or something like that. But then what we're seeing is that in the 1980s, 1990s, in Houston, there are many more new groups, African American, black and Hispanic, in the western side of the city as well. So they're, because we went through this cycle of an economic recession, many people left the city, and many apartment complexes were left empty. 
and then apartment owners then rushed out to recruit immigrant renters to to see what to save those apartments. So we see like there are all kinds of Hispanic and black nationalities, not only U.S. born blacks, but Caribbean and African, living out in the western half of the city, along Westheimer mm -hmm. in the southwest, right? So that's certainly, it's integration to the extent that you have new minorities, racial minorities living among whites, okay? But if you actually go into those communities, you don't find a lot of intergroup interaction. So see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So statistically, it looks like segregation has decreased, okay? Because then you have blacks and Hispanics living among Anglos. But when you actually visit those communities, you find that often those groups interact mainly among themselves. So it's a greater spreading out of, the, of ethnic pop and racial populations, but there's a lack of interaction with you know, the white U.S. born population. Interesting. One of the um, diagnostics of postmodernism has been uh, the kinds of transformations that have occurred in the space of the city. Mm -hmm. What of uh, you of the shifts in the organization of, of space mm -hmm. that you've just mentioned, would you say would be appropriately termed postmodern, or part of postmodernism? Or do you think Houston is a postmodern city? I think there's, there's certainly postmodern pockets. To the extent that postmodern includes pluralism and plurality of experiences, uh, and the way we reconstitute space, and the way we bring new symbolism to space, Mm -hmm. that there's certainly a lot of that in the western half of the city, for example. Many areas that before were, shall we say, dominated by the established uh, white or Anglo population mm -hmm. or have now been reconstituted, redefined, reconfigured, and given new symbolic meaning by immigrant groups, new groups that are there. Mm -hmm. An example, I look at uh, this park out there near uh, in the southwest, the Golfton area. I think Burnett Balin Park it used to be a county park. I think it's the city's taking it over, something like that. When I first came here, <coughs> the people who were out there were mainly Anglo residents of the neighborhood, playing baseball, some basketball. Then later, some rugby players came out there, <laughs> immigrants from England or whatever. <laughs> And now when you go out there, who plays out there? Well, baseball is gone and rugby is pretty much gone. They're playing soccer you know, and African-Americans are playing basketball. So to that extent, and then the whole park takes a new flavor, a new symbolic meaning. You have a lot of Hispanic immigrant families out there playing with piñatas and birthdays and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you can see how you know this, this migration has really reshaped social space. And that's really a, uh, a special focus of mine. Not only that, but the competition among groups for public space. Mm -hmm. Who gets to use a park? Who gets to define the park's priority? And you get into issues of well, who controls the park? Well, county commissioners control the park. So who has access to power that, that, that defines you know, the, the, the rules of behavior at the park? All kinds of issues there. And so I think that in many ways there are, you know, postmodern uh, areas mm -hmm. that are very much affected by immigration in our city. Mm -hmm. Let me follow up the question on postmodernism with another one. You mentioned uh, four waves. Mm -hmm. uh, the first wave beginning in 1825, right. if I remember correctly. And uh, the ch kinds of transformations in migration and the transna increased transnationalism, increased migration has been one of the uh, Diagnostic features again of the of postmodernism or of uh, mm -hmm. the transformations of late capitalism at the end of the 20th century. So I was wondering if you could tell me, but uh, there are times where you were in the discussions before and responding to the questions, you were giving us some shifts of w changes. But maybe you could sort of can give us a description of these fourth waves and tell us whether there is a justification for calling uh, the end of the 20th century postmodern in terms of migration. Well, what <coughs> Two waves, and one wave is, the, the first one is really statistically defined meaning because when they started keeping records and we see that in the 1820s, 1830s, 40s, there's this wave, right? And then we see like the 1860s, 70s, 80s, there's this other wave, and then the 1910s, you know, there's this other wave, and then the one we're in. The first two waves are obviously in the 1800s, the other two waves are in this century. What is 
what is different about the third wave is is that it, there are different immigrants involved. The third wave is the immigrant the immigration from from uh, southern Europe <coughs> and Eastern Europe. This is the coming of the Italians. Many come from peasant backgrounds, and this is the coming of the Jews. Jewish populations from Eastern Europe. And here we began to see a strong backlash against immigration. Almost everything we see today against all the, the anti-immigrant fervor happened in that way. So we have certainly an immigration from new cultural zones of Europe, so that's different. It's also a wave very much related to U.S. industrialization in the early part of our century. So it, you know, Instead of people coming because they think they're going to get a farm out in Iowa or someplace, people are coming because they want to work in the railroads, or the railroads are already built, but rebuild or whatever, repair. Certainly work in the factories. Okay, so there's a difference there in those waves. That third wave is very important because there's a political dimension to it. Every wave has a political dimension, but this one is what we call the Red Scare. The idea <laughs> that many of those immigrants are coming to organize communists or uh, labor unions as a socialist. And there's this government uh, operation across the country to look for communists <laughs> and to, to destroy the communist movement and export. Many people are exported because they're labor organizers. This is, if you look at the 1910s, well, what happened in 1917, the Russian Revolution. There's this, there is a red scare for capital. <laughs> and they think many of, the, many of the Europeans are coming to war. And in fact, there, there is heightened labor or, or, or organizing. In, in, the, in the country. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another major difference there. I think that there's a distinction in terms of, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm just trying to show the difference between. Yeah. How about hemispherically speaking? What kind of changes? Is, or is that. Uh, mm. are, are these trends that you've identified uh, with regard to the United States? Uh, well, where we find them, places. Uh, hemispherically with the, Amer with the Americas. I think you could make, hemispherically, there's similarity, let's say, with Brazil, maybe Argentina, and pockets of Mexico, to the extent that they're also industrializing, mm -hmm. okay? But there's very little comparison in a similar fashion, let's say, Central America, or Peru, Bolivia, because they're either mining or agriculture. And these are not s sites of, uh, of migration? Not People great don't migration, go. not great migration, you're right. Should we open it up? Yes. Yes, I have a question for you, Dr. Rodriguez. Yes. In your studies in the Houston area, I wonder if you've uh, looked at all at the reaction of uh, ESL-based curriculums in schools. The reactions by... People's attitudes. I find them. two reactions among immigrants. Uh, there are some immigrants, just like in the general population. There are some immigrants who <clears throat> say, I want my kid to just be thrown in the river and have a sink or swim experience. So I found immigrant parents who prefer that their students be based in English only instruction. Uh, and in fact, go to schools and ask, demand this, okay? Uh, I found on the other hand also parents who prefer that, who not prefer, but they enjoy the bilingual education of their children. And maybe I'm not, I may have gone off your question, but I can come back to it, believe me. <laughs> Uh, who prefer uh, bilingual education because kids can learn their language and uh, and uh, their how to read and write, but also the important language of English because people live here. Uh, and if you can have mastery over two languages other than one, some people prefer that. Now, you asked, you asked specifically about ESL, right? English is a second. Well, in a way, I guess I'm dealing with ESL because. Uh, my understanding is some of the bilingual programs are actually a way to introduce English as a second language, but they do it through a bilingual mode or something like that. My final point is that among immigrants, there is you know, there's a debate, just as we see in the general population. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Rodriguez, I have another question for you. Um, in my very limited exposure and or experience with people from Mexico, uh, I understand that uh, joining union, unions or creating labor unions is very popular and um, it's a way for the people to gain what they need, especially through 
uh, political means from their workplace. And I'm sorry to be confusing this a little bit, but it seems that um, the uh, the workplace is very politically controlled and that if people can raise up and say, well, we need more money for Christmas or we need more money for this and this, then the political unit can say to the company, okay, you need to give out more money. Now, how do Mexicans, the immigrants who come to this country, deal with not having that powerful voice? Well, <clears throat> you're right. I think in, um, in Mexico there's a strong labor movement. But I th and I think you brought up some important words there, that it is very politically controlled. Much of Mexican society, many sectors of Mexican society are attached to the, the PRI, this, uh, the Institutionalized Revolutionary Party, which is like a spinal cord in Mexican society. <laughs> and any, any club, almost any, any the women's sewing club, uh, the labor union of barbers, uh, scientists who study frogs in uh, salt water, they all belong to the PRI, they're incorporated. So this is like a spinal cord that controls uh, a lot of Mexican society and labor unions as well. When Mexicans come over here from this experience, now not all Mexicans come from labor unions or urban areas. Some, some come from rural areas who maybe not have labor unions, but whatever. Uh, it's clear that they're, they're aware, how shall I say, of their vulnerability. Because they're immigrants, because it's the, in a way, and this is not really correct, they need us a lot more than we need them, meaning that they need a job desperately to buy food and th pay for housing. Uh, they have no choice, so they have to accommodate to this. There are many cases, especially in agriculture, where immigrants do get involved in labor organizing. Okay. Yes, yes. I'm sir. sorry to interrupt you again, mm -hmm. but if if they had the experience of having a powerful voice at home, quote unquote, sorry, yeah. but. How have you have you spoken with people about how they deal with not having that powerful voice any longer? Yes, and what I what I I've gotten out of that are two things. Okay, one is that they realize that they can't have it here because they're immigrants and they're vulnerable. Okay, the other point is many of the immigrants that I talk to who are workers think that one day they're going to go back to Mexico that they're only here temporarily. Of course, that's like a false dream because eventually they have children who grew up marry and they stay here forever, or, meaning until they pass away. So that, and many of them who come from Mexico know that the, the, the powerful voice was really controlled by the PRI. Okay. All right. Well, thank you immensely for yeah. taking so much time. I'm going to be continuing now and talking about the history sure. of migration to the Americas. Again, we Okay, We're well, thank you. Incredibly for fortunate to have such an expert with us. Thank you. Are you still taping? We are still taping. Your question is really works for the Salvadorians who came here in the 80s while their country was going through civil war. And I met many organizers who, in fact, started organizing labor unions here. Uh, they organized a union of women cleaner, uh, office cleaners downtown. Every night there's an army of women who clean downtown offices. The first and only labor union of office cleaners downtown is organized by Salvadorians who came from that labor experience of labor organizing. I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah. It was broken by INS raids uh, mm -hmm. a month later uh, after they were organized. That's interesting. Okay. Well, thank you thank so you much. much. I enjoyed it. Thank you for coming. Good thank luck. you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Americans are highly ambivalent about immigrants. Every civics textbook that you've ever seen says this is a nation of immigrants, a refuge for the tired and the poor. But nativism, hostility towards immigrants, also has been a hardy strain in America and it flourishes in times of economic and political uncertainty. And we live in such a time of uncertainty and nativism flourishes now. So repeatedly over the past 200 years, Americans have expressed fears about a flood of immigrants, a flood that many fear will threaten our economic security, 
or our religious and cultural traditions. So ambivalence has been the dominant American response to immigration. On the one hand, the nation's founders believed that it was possible to create a country in which people of vastly different cultural and religious traditions could be blended into one. E pluribus unum was their motto, and that's Latin for from many one. No other country has sought to do this. But at the same time, there has been deep hostility towards immigrants. And as Professor Rodriguez has shown us, attitudes towards immigration cross and blur ideological and political lines. It would be a mistake to assume, for example, that liberals are automatically pro-immigration and that conservatives are automatically anti-immigration. In fact, the story is much more confused and much more complicated than that. Free marketeers, like the Wall Street Journal, believe that the free flow of people, like the free flow of capital or goods or ideas, will lead to prosperity. Nativists, that is opponents of immigration, fear that immigrants pose a threat to the Anglo-Saxon part of the American culture. Civil rights groups tend to view immigration as a human rights issue and tend to view hostility towards immigration as racist, though some civil rights advocates fear that lower income African Americans tend to be the greatest victims of large scale immigration. Some environmentalists fear that population increases will produce an overcrowded America and therefore will diminish environmental protections over time. Job preservationists believe that immigration depresses wages and takes wages away from unskilled Americans. In other words, there's not just one group or two groups on the issue of immigration. Rather, there are a multiplicity of interests all of which have very different agendas and very different sets of priorities. Now, the argument that I'm going to give you in today's class is that few forces in world history have done more to shape the modern world than immigration. Immigration has been one of the greatest engines of social cultural change. Now, people move for many reasons. Sometimes they move because of voluntary choice. Sometimes they move because they are forced to move. Sometimes they move because of dislocations that impel them to move, whether these are economic or political or cultural. But the crucial point I'd argue to you is that immigration has shaped the face of the modern world and will continue to shape the nature of our world in the years ahead. As I mentioned when we were talking to Professor Rodriguez, in 1500 the world was highly segregated by race. But today, people of 
every racial and ethnic background can be found in virtually every part of the globe. Why that happened and what it means for the future are the issues that we need to confront now. From 1500 to 1914, that's when World War I broke out, between 60 and 65 million Europeans migrated internationally. We don't have as good figures on peoples from other parts of the world, but I think a fair estimate might be this, that something between 15 and 25 million people from Asia and Africa also migrated internationally. This does not include migrations within countries' areas. Now, since World War I, those figures have been far outstripped. Since World War I, immigration has vastly increased in size and scale, and this is due to a variety of push factors and pull factors. Some of these factors are political, political strife, civil war, governmental breakdown, war. These political factors have been driving forces for immigration. Global communications, global transportation systems, these too have helped facilitate the worldwide transplantation of peoples. The demand for cheap labor has been a fundamental factor fueling worldwide population movements and to the desire to raise incomes and improve living standards. These two have been factors pressing for immigration. Now, immigration is not a new phenomenon. It did not begin in 1500. People have always had a penchant for moving about and in the beginning, the dawn of history, as they say, the earliest migrants were driven by the search for food. Most peoples were hunters and gatherers, and hunting and gathering people required about 5,000 acres per person to subsist. And this meant that as the population gradually grew in size, it was necessary for the population to expand geographically. But the discovery of agriculture seemingly changed that. Instead of needing 5,000 acres to support a person, in the Nile Valley or in Mesopotamia, you only needed one acre of land. And you might think that the discovery of agriculture would have brought migration to an end, and we would have a very brief lecture today. But it wouldn't at all be the case. Other factors would keep people moving. Urbanization, that is movement from rural to urban areas. The quest for raw materials and slaves. The desire to spread religion. These have been fundamental factors in making population move. But what I will be showing you in the second part of our class is that after 1500, the nature of migration would be increased hugely because of the growth of what we'll call the modern world capitalist system.
Let's take a brief break. 